When I saw this dresser, it was first listed by its previous owner who had attempted to refinish it. I did not buy it at the time, but a month or so later, it was listed again by a local reseller who didn't have the time or space to refinish the piece. So I figured, why not? Restorations of painted furniture pieces can often be quite challenging. There are a lot of unknowns as far as what is under the paint or even why the piece may have been painted in the first place. As frustrating as these can be, I do enjoy the challenge every once in a while. On pieces like this, I prefer to start off using a paint scraper. This cuts down on the amount of paint stripper that I may need to use, if any at all. Based on the peeling paint on the top, the leg, and the underside of this dresser, there are going to be two layers of paint that have to be removed. The first layer is gray chalk paint, and I believe the blue is a latex-based paint. The gray looks like it's Rust-Oleum chalk paint, if I had to guess. Either way, using the paint scraper, while it's an additional effort, will alleviate the need for two to three coats of stripper. And on a piece this size, that could easily be one container of stripper. If you've never used a paint scraper before, it isn't too difficult to use. The hardest part is getting started. But once you get started on a section, the paint scraper is going to grab on to the next section. You don't want to apply too much pressure. It's more about the angle. You also want to make sure that you're going in the direction of the wood grain. This way, if you scrape the veneer or wood, it's pretty easy to conceal. When removing the drawers from pieces, I number the bottoms so that I can put them back in the correct place, and then I don't have to think about where the drawer goes. There are quite a lot of drawer repairs on this piece. This repair was damage that was done to the back dovetail joint on one of the drawers, and you can see that the plies started to separate. To fix this, I ended up gluing the pieces back together. Then I taped and clamped the drawer. Once this was done, there were some gaps in the dovetail plies where they had broken off over time. So I simply wedged some coffee stirrers into the gaps. Once everything dried, I sanded it smooth. A substantial amount of paint was still on the curved drawer handles and embedded in the wood grain. I opted to use Stripwell's QCS stripper, which is an eco-friendly stripper, to remove the last bits of paint. If the steel wool did not dislodge the paint from the wood, I first tried a nylon brush, and in certain areas I did switch to a soft brass brush. I'm certain this is going to be a point of contention and some of you are going to cringe. But this specific brush is made for stripping soft surfaces. I wouldn't use this on soft wood, but the veneer faces on the drawers is walnut. It certainly made me a bit nervous to use, but the alternative is to spend one eternity hand-picking paint from the drawers. Honestly, it was quite effective and probably saved me a lot of time. The fifth leg on this dresser is meant to be mounted in the center of the piece. It was initially attached using staples. So in order to reattach it, I removed the staples and opted to screw the board into the bottom of the dresser. 
This should make it sturdier in case someone decides to drag the piece across the floor, which is probably what caused them to fall out to begin with. One of the drawers had what I originally thought to be a sanded down spot on the corner. And it ended up being that the wood fibers were just split apart and compressed. There was a lot of paint that I ended up removing from this to fix it, but what I ended up doing was applying wood glue to the cracked wood, and then I taped the piece back together. I used a piece of dowel to help support the piece while it was drying. The top left drawer handle had a large chunk of wood missing from the corner. I wanted to use quick wood to repair this damage, so I added two nails to reinforce the quick wood. Then I spent a good amount of time molding the quick wood as close to the shape of the broken handle as possible. This stuff dries hard, so having less product is better because that's less sanding later. I considered for a moment just painting this laminate top, but I felt like that would be counterintuitive to all the work that I put into removing the paint. However, I want to point out that the veneer that I purchased for this piece cost $75. It would most certainly be cheaper to paint the top, especially if you're looking to flip furniture for a profit. Thanks to viewers like you, the money that I generate from YouTube ad revenue allows me to make these kinds of enhancements to pieces. I've been putting the income from YouTube back into my projects and shop enhancements so that I can do more projects like this one. The walnut veneer that I purchased is paperbacked, and I'll link all the products used for this project in the description below. To attach the veneer to the laminate, I scuff sanded the laminate with 150 grit sandpaper, and then I wiped the surface clean. Next, I'm going to cut down the veneer so that there isn't as much excess veneer hanging over the sides while I'm trying to attach it. You'll want to have a bit of overhang to ensure that you properly cover the whole piece. To attach the two substrates together, I applied contact cement using a chip brush to both surfaces. In my experience, it is a good idea to apply two coats of contact cement to the paper-backed veneer. For whatever reason, the paper-backed stuff seems to soak up the contact cement. Once the contact cement is dried, per the instructions, I placed dowels across the top of the surface so that I could adjust and slowly press the two surfaces together. If you've never used contact cement before, once the two surfaces touch each other, they adhere. So the dowels give you more control. The humidity in the area that you're applying contact cement to is important. Since I live in Florida, the humidity can get in the upwards range of 80%, so I always monitor it when I'm working with different products like contact cement or even finishes. I do own a dehumidifier as well, but contact cement is very fumy and should be applied in a well-ventilated area. As I'm pressing the veneer down, I start from one side and I press my hands from the center to the sides. This is meant to reduce the chance of getting air pockets between the two substrates. A general recommendation is to apply 75 pounds of pressure to get good adhesion between the surfaces. I use a J roller, but I've seen other methods such as using a board. To trim the veneer to size, I use a fresh razor blade. When I'm making cross grain cuts, I find that you're less likely to get tear out if you first score the veneer and then come back and make the final cut. You could also use a flush trim bit in a router. 
In preparation to apply the final finishes to the piece, I sanded everything down using 180 grit sandpaper, and then I used my orbital sander on the flat surfaces, while I hand sanded all the detailed areas. It was at this point in the project that I decided I wanted to see what the piece would look like with just a polyurethane applied to it. I was hoping that there would be a nice contrast on the piece, so I used Minwax Aerosol Polyurethane and I applied one coat to the entire piece and I let it dry overnight so that I could see what it looked like the next morning. I'm very glad that I waited before applying more finish to the piece. The color seemed to be very pale, and the contrast on the wood grain didn't look right. My assumption is that the drawers were slightly tinted blue from the paint. And it was at this point that I switched gears and started to apply antique walnut gel stain to the piece. Gel stain can be applied over existing finishes. The polyurethane coat also enhanced what appeared to be water discoloration on the legs of the piece. So if you're really wanting to keep something like the legs a natural color and they have water damage or discoloration, this can usually be resolved with oxalic acid. I opted to stain them since they wouldn't match the piece otherwise. Once the stain had dried, I applied three additional coats of aerosol polyurethane, and after that final coat dried, I sanded the surface to remove any little imperfections that landed while the final coat was drying, using a high grit sandpaper. If you've seen my videos before, you probably know by now that I really like to drive home the point of taking these final steps. Cleaning the piece with a vacuum inside and out after you're finished working on it is going to remove all the dust and debris that may have gotten inside of the piece. Not to mention that the inside of the dresser has probably never been cleaned since it was manufactured. I also apply Howard's wood polish and conditioner to the wooden drawer sliders so that they don't stick. And I use a wood conditioner on all of the raw wood surfaces to rehydrate the wood. These steps really make a difference in the quality of the final piece. When I brought this piece home, it was rather drab. But here's the end result. I hope you think it's fab. A lot of work was put into this dresser, and while I don't show you every second of it, I hope that you find I made it better. So please like and subscribe. Hopefully that doesn't sound like a bribe. Either way, I'll see you next time.